Welcome, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. I'm just going to go ahead and open up with prayer, and we'll get started. Let's praise you, God. Hallelujah. We worship you, God. Your holy name is worthy to be praised, God. Holy Spirit, we just ask you to be here with us, Lord God. Lord, lead everything that I say, Lord God, have your way in it, Lord God. I ask you to prepare hearts, prepare minds, Lord God, to hear what you want to say, what you have for each individual, Lord God. Just pray that you would make people receptive to what you have to say, Lord God. Have your way, God, to be glorified, be magnified in this place today, Lord God. Lord, help me, Lord God. Help me to, to do my part in it, Lord God. I just want to get out of your way and let you move. Praise you, God. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Praise you, God. All right. All right. Well, let's get started. I, I have a message today, and I titled it Empty Vessels Plus Obedience. So hopefully that you'll get something out of this. So I did. This is something that God really showed me um, over the last, I'd say, about week or two. God's really been speaking to him about me, me about this message. So um, hopefully what I have been getting from God will come across. Hopefully I can get it to come across. So pray for me. So. Um, what do I mean by vessels? I think most of you probably know what I mean by vessels, but I'll go ahead and explain it anyway. Uh, the definition, the official definition of vessels is a couple of them, a container for holding something, or the other one is a person into whom some quality is infused. So I think those are both pretty good definitions for it. And then in the Bible itself, there are many, many scripture references where um, the Bible, the, the Word of God compares people to vessels. And so, and I'm not going to read all of the, the verses now, but just to name a few, um, there's Jeremiah 18, verse 4, uh, 2 Timothy 2, 21. So if you want to write these down and look them up later, it's up to you. Feel free. And then 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7, 1 Peter 3, verse 7, and Romans 9, verse 21. That's just to name a few. There's quite a few in the Word of God that compares people to vessels. So I think it's a, it's a good comparison. And so what do I mean by empty vessels? Again, the title of this and the meaning of this is empty vessels plus obedience. So what do I mean by empty vessels? Well, I, I want to quote our pastor here. Hopefully I can quote him right. I know I can get the gist of it, but Pastor George, I've heard him say several times something like this. The more we are full of ourselves, the less space there is for God to fill. That's something like that, but did you get the you get the point? So the more we have, we're filled up with ourselves and our pride and our flesh, the less room God has to pour into us. So that's the gist of that. Um, and even as Christians, uh, we have a natural tendency if we just fall back and relax. We have a natural tendency to uh, just it's like gravity. Gravity just kind of takes over in our life and, and pulls us back into the flesh or back into selfishness. And uh, if, if we're not very intentional about our spiritual life, about our spiritual walk, that's what's going to happen. And we can't just put it on autopilot. You know, I think there's been times I've thought, you know, if I can just reach a certain level, if I can just spend enough time with God and I can pray enough and I can learn enough things from the Word, then I'll reach a certain level, and then I can pretty much, I'll just stay there. I'll put in cruise control, and I can stay there. But I've found out the hard way that's not the case. It's a daily walk. We have to be going into God's presence every day. We have to be totally reliant on Him, on His Spirit, every single day. Um, so don't make the mistake I've, I've made in the past at times, um, thinking that, it can become an easy walk once you reach a certain level. It's that every day, every day, we have to come back to God every day, and we have to bring that empty vessel to God every day. And I'll explain more about that later. <clears throat> um, basically, I think the Word of God makes it clear what emptying the vessel means, and, and I'll explain what I mean by that from the Word of God. I think uh, we as humans, are, are, again, I'm comparing us as humans to vessels the same way the Word of God does very often. And to empty that vessel, I think, is basically a few different things that I took note on here. It's to die to self, to get our self out of the way. Uh, basically, that's like dying to my goals unless they line up with God's goals for my life. 
uh, to die to my wants, to just get my wants out of the way, unless they line up with God, what, with what He wants for my life. And to die to our pride, die to our ego, our fears, anything that isn't the Holy Spirit in us, leading us and guiding us. Any of those things we need to try to get rid of with the Holy Spirit's help. We need to be coming back into God's presence and asking Him to just clean us out of those things so that we can be empty of all the things that get in the way of what He wants to do. And I know all that's a lot easier said than done. It's way easier said than done. But uh, another example of what, what I felt like God showed me, one, one of many examples of empty in ourselves as a person, is uh, in the, the story of the prodigal son. That's Luke 15, verses 17 through 24. Could you bring that up on the screen? Again, this is the story of the prodigal son. Uh, but when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread? But I'm dying here with hunger. Notice he came to his senses. I will get up and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. So he got up and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Notice that humility there. But the father said to his slaves, quickly bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fattened calf, kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found and they began to celebrate. And I know that story is very familiar to most people here. Uh, I love that story, though. Uh, that's, a, that's a wonderful story of God's forgiveness and mercy. But um, the point here that I'd like to make is, I think this is an example, a good example of, of a human being who has made mistakes, who originally was filled with greed, was filled with selfishness and what he wanted, you know, he wanted the, the inheritance from his dad. He wanted it in advance, and he wanted to leave home and go do his own thing. He didn't want to come under any kind of authority. He wanted to go have fun, basically. And so once he came to his senses, like the word said, once he came to his senses and realized that uh, he needed to make a change, I love the fact that he humbled himself and came back to his father, which represents, you know, obviously, us coming back to God when we've slipped away or backslidden or uh, made mistakes, things like that. And, and so I think this is a good example of how he emptied himself of that pride and that selfishness and brought himself back empty, just desperate for God to work in him um, for his father in this situation. But he brought himself back empty and just desperate to, to be loved and to have a home and to have that companionship the same way we want from God. And that story's in the Bible for a reason. It's not just a random story. God wants us to know that that's his heart for us. So don't forget that. God's heart for us is that. Forgiveness, love, mercy. Praise God. Praise God. And uh, again, another example of emptying ourselves, which is even better. Um, Jesus, he's our perfect example of everything. The perfect example of everything. Could you bring up Philippians 2? Verses 3 through 11. Thank you. And so this, this says, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility. While, while I'm reading this, by the way, I just kind of notice these are some of the traits, I think, of, of being empty of ourself um, and being focused on others, not being absorbed with our own needs and wants. So I'll start over. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. And have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, 
did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. And here's the uh, kind of the key part of this, I think. But he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And for this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. Jesus, yes. And so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so I think that that is our perfect example of emptying ourselves. Uh, and I'll kind of go back over the, just the gist of that. Um, Jesus, he was, he's God. He was God before he came to the cross. He had all the riches of heaven. He had all the authority of heaven. He had all the power. He had every angel in heaven to defend him. He didn't even need it. But he, he was in total charge of everything with every rich. Every riches of heaven was his. And he gave that up. He emptied himself. Um, he emptied himself of selfishness. He, he emptied himself of his flesh because he was in flesh when he was on this earth. He totally submitted to his father and to the will of his father. He totally submitted himself. And it was for our good. It was for our eternal well-being, for, for us to spend eternity with him. Total selflessness from Jesus. He emptied himself for that reason. And again, that, I believe, is our perfect example of emptying our vessel for God to be able to use us the same way he was able to use Jesus to save us from our sin. And so, again, there, <coughs> excuse me, in the Bible, there are also many examples of God using empty vessels. And so I'm going to bring a few of those up and, and filling those empty vessels up by his miraculous power. So, and I believe these stories are true in the Bible. These stories are these empty vessels that God filled uh, with his miraculous power. But even though they're true stories, I believe, they're very full of symbolism, types and shadows, um, and they're very meaningful. So let's look at a couple of those examples of God uh, filling empty vessels when they were brought to him. Um, can you bring up John 2, verses 1 through 8? Again, that's John 2, verses 1 through 8. Um, on the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does that have to do with us? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Now, there were six stone water pots, and these are the vessels. There were six stone water pots set there for Jewish custom of purification, containing 20 or 30 gallons each. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. So they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. So they took it to him. <clears throat> I'd like to point out a couple things about this story. Obviously, the things I've already said, there are containers there that God used. Um, but there was also a level of obedience. The, these servants had to take these water pots full of water. They had to take and fill it with water, and they had to take some to the head waiter. And I, I mean, I, there's a lot of this story that I've focused on, but have you ever thought about the uh, kind of the risk those servants took? by obeying Jesus, who they did, probably didn't know. They may have known him, known him, but they this was his first miracle. This was Jesus' first miracle. So they had no idea what he could do. They didn't know that he was going to perform miracles. So they really risked their reputations, I think. They prob possibly risked punishment from their, you know, the people that were above them, uh, maybe risked their jobs. Um, but they were obedient. This was... This is a good example of the type of obedience that we need to be willing to do uh, for God, uh, even when it's risky to us, even when it makes no sense and 
our reputations are on the line, our livelihood may be on the line. Um, so I don't know if you've ever thought about that part of it, but it, that part hit me when I was studying about this. <clears throat> and so there's one of the uh, the forms of obedience that it's it's like childlike obedience, you know. Um, and, and the other parts of the Word of God say we need to have childlike faith. And so that that's kind of what that is. It's, uh, these servants just did what Jesus told them and took a chance. And of course, we're not taking a chance, really, if Jesus is on our side. But it may seem like that in our flesh. It may seem like we're taking a chance. But um, Then could you bring up John 21, verses 3 through 8? Thank you. And this is another example. It's not exactly the, the same type of vessel, but it's a container. Um, so Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. This is, by the way, this is after Jesus had been crucified um, and was resurrected, so, and Jesus came back. Um, Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing, and they said to him, we'll, we will also come with you. They went out and got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. But when the day was, was now breaking, Jesus stood on the beach, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. And so Jesus said to them, children, you do not have any fish, do you? And they answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you'll find a catch. So they cast, and then they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. So when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put his outer, he put his outer garment on, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. But the other disciples came in a little boat, for they were not far from land, but about 100 yards away, dragging the net full of fish. I think this is an, another of many amazing stories. Um, but, but this, again, they had an empty net. They'd been fishing all night, not catching anything. Um, but then Jesus, they needed the net. They needed the, the vessel. We'll call it a vessel in this situation. But they also had to do that what looked like silly thing to humans that, that didn't make any common sense. These were professional fishermen. I know you've probably heard this before, but they obeyed. They, they obeyed like children. Whatever Jesus tells me to do, I'm going to do it. I'm not going to question it. I'm not going to say that doesn't make sense. I'm going to follow him. And so they cast the net over the other side, and look what happened. They, they pulled in so many fish, they couldn't even hold it all. They had to have help to drag the fish in. So as another example of an empty vessel and obedience where we have to not just simple not not just the kind of obedience that makes sense either so that's that's the key I'm really trying to point out is sometimes we have to obey when it makes no sense no other human being may understand why we're doing what we're doing no other person may think it makes any sense they may even make fun of us it's quite likely somebody might make fun of us for doing things sometimes that Jesus tells us to do but we have to be willing sometimes to make, kind of make fools out of ourselves for God. It's just like it comes to mind when David was, uh, br when they were bringing the ark back in um, and bringing it to the temple that they had built. And he was <laughs> dancing naked, praising God. I'm sure, you know, the word says that, that his, his, one of his wives made fun of him and, and, and criticized him for that. So people don't understand sometimes when we're following the Lord. Now, I'm not advocating that anybody... Uh, takes their clothes off here and, and worships God, so don't do that. But, <laughs> but, uh, but I'm just saying that sometimes obeying God involves a type of obedience that will not make sense to others. So, um, but I, I do think that that type of obedience, especially, especially when it goes against common sense and when it goes against reason, it, it really shows a, a different level of trust that, trust that we have in God when, it, when it's the Holy Spirit leading us to do it. We can't just do crazy things just to try to prove we trust God. But when the Holy Spirit is leading us to do something, and it may sometimes seem way out there, like it doesn't, doesn't make any sense at all, but when we go ahead and do that, that, I believe, shows God this whole other level of trust that we have in here and in, in Him. And I believe he honors that, and he responds to that level of trust. Um, and I, again, that shows through our actions, not just in our thoughts, just, just in our words, but that shows through some action that we trust God that deeply. 
And again, I'm not saying we should go out and do stupid things that make no sense just to prove something. And again, more often than not, I do believe that the right thing to do will also be common sense. Usually, it'll be wisdom. Even, even non-Christians would agree with godly wisdom, usually. But once in a while, all I'm saying is once in a while, there will be the things, I think in every Christian's life, once in a while, there'll be something the Holy Spirit tells us to do, wants us to do, that nobody else is going to agree with. They're not gonna, it's not going to make sense to them. And I think He will test us sometimes this way. I really believe that that's a test. And He's just seeing where our heart is. How much, how much do we trust Him? He wants to know, are we relying more on human wisdom and human logic and, and our flesh? Are we truly relying on Him and His Holy Spirit and His leading? Are we really hearing His voice? Are we really trusting Him? Are we really trusting Him to the point that we will obey Him? So that's just something to keep in mind. If, you, if you're feeling like God is really calling you to do something or wanting you, it may be something small that's just uncomfortable. Sometimes He just wants you to go talk to a stranger or maybe even a family member and tell them about Him, and we may be scared to death to do that. And that may be the test. I think sometimes that's just that test. It goes against every reason. That person may have told us many times, don't talk to me about Jesus anymore. I've had that experience. Stop talking to me that way. I don't want to hear anything about your God. And so then God may say, go back and talk to him again. And that may not make any sense to us. And, and I'm, again, I'm not advocating badgering people because we have to let the Holy Spirit work in their hearts. So sometimes it's time to back off and let God change their hearts. That, that's usually the case. Um, and let somebody else, maybe somebody else is going to water the seed that you planted. So there is that. But sometimes God is just saying, go back, talk to them again. Or there's many, I can't name all the different versions of this, where we need to be obedient when it doesn't make any sense. But just, just keep in mind, and if the Holy Spirit's bringing something to your mind right now that he's been telling you to do, that, and you're thinking, that doesn't make any sense, but it keeps coming back to your mind, just ask, Holy Spirit, is this really you? And, and if he confirms it's him wanting you to do it, then I just advise you go do it. Even if it doesn't make sense, go do it. Um, and then the next, the next part is with that empty vessel. Uh, when we bring him that in, empty vessel, and, and we're desperately seeking him, and we're bringing an empty vessel to him, and we're wanting him to fill us, the Lord is more than willing to fill us. It's not something he grudgingly is going to do, like, okay, I, I owe you this. My word says I'll do it, so I guess I'll fill you. It's not like that. He loves us, and he wants to fill us up with him, with his Holy Spirit. He wants to fill us with more of him. He wants to fill us with uh, more of his discernment, uh, more of the, the gifts of the Spirit. He wants to use us. He wants, and it's not just like we're a tool in his, his, his tool bag, but he wants to use us because then he gets to fellowship with us. He gets to use us. It's really more like a privilege if he, if he will use us. It's not a, just a duty. It's more of a privilege for God to use us. But my point here, I got a little sidetracked, is he wants to fill us. That's exactly what he wants to do if we're willing and if we want to be filled with him. And could you bring up Matthew 5, verse 6? Uh, another example here of, of how he wants to fill us. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. And that's a promise in the word of God. If you hunger and thirst for him and for righteousness, he will fill us with that. He will satisfy that hunger. And then could you bring up Isaiah 55, verses 1 through 3? Oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. Everyone, you see that, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in abundance. <clears throat> Incline your ear and come to me. Listen that you may live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you according to the faithful mercies shown to David. I think that just shows a lot of God's heart there. He, 
everyone. He's inviting everyone. He's, he's wanting everyone to come to him and ask him. Just ask him. Just, just approach him humbly and ask him. And he is so willing to fill us. He wants to fill us. He wants to give us the bread of life. He wants to give us the good things. And he knows what we need, and he knows what's, what are the best things for us. And so that's just another scripture that shows God's heart, I believe, and, and how generous he is, how selfless and generous our, our loving God is. And then could you bring up another scripture <clears throat> that's very similar? Revelation 21, verses 5 and 6. Thank you. <clears throat> and he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Right, for these words are faithful and true. And then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. Praise God. Hallelujah. Again, again, this shows God's heart. He wants to give us from the eternal springs that he provides, the water of life, the water of eternal life. He wants to give us, but we have to thirst. We have to thirst. He can't provide the thirst. We have to thirst. He will provide the water. He'll provide that spring, that eternal spring that will go on and on forever, and it wells up into eternal life in us, and it overflows onto other people. And so we can minister to other people, so we can share his love with other people, so we can uh, do everything that Jesus did on this earth as far as the miracles and the signs and wonders. His word says that we will be able to do that. But we have to thirst. We have to thirst. That's the part that's on us. We have to thirst and come to him. <clears throat> Praise God. And then also John, could you go to John 6, verse 35? And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger and he who believes in me will never thirst. And praise God. Praise you, Jesus. Again, it's more very similar there. Jesus is saying, he's the bread. He's the bread we need. If we're hungry, come to him. And we won't hunger anymore if we have him. And if we're thirsty, again, come to him. He will provide us what we need and we'll never thirst. We have to have the hunger. We have to have the thirst for him. But he provides what we need when we bring that to him. And again, hunger and thirst, that's another, that's kind of symbolic of an empty vessel. We, we need something. We're empty. And we know, we need to know that he is the only one that can satisfy. He's the only one that can actually fill us with what we really need. And so when we bring that empty vessel and we're desperate and we ask him, he will fill us with what we need. <clears throat> and many times, you know, there are times in our life when we need a miracle or some, somebody we know needs a miracle um, or we need an answer or a breakthrough. These, these things just happen. It's life. It's a part of life. But many times that miracle, that answer we need, that breakthrough we need, it, it, this is what we need to do. We need to bring him this, an empty vessel, ourself, emptied out, humble and desperate to him. And we need to make room for him to move in our life. And how do we do that? By getting ourself out of the way, by getting, you know, our, our just self-interest, our selfishness, our, some, sometimes it's sin that we're doing, some, things like that that are in our vessel, polluting the vessel. And, and so, so often, we just need to clean out that vessel, allow him to clean the vessel out, but bring ourselves to him desperately and humble. And then, there are times when we just need to obey him. And again, like I said earlier, it's sometimes it's, it's like it's not a normal obedience that makes sense to people. So um, no matter what he's leading us to do in those situations, sometimes that's the test for us to get the thing we need is will we listen to him? And it's, it's, it's a test of our heart. He's not, just wanting, he's not just wanting to do something through us necessarily, I think. Sometimes he is, but really he's looking on the heart. I believe he's really wanting to see where our heart is with him sometimes. Um, and so, again, just kind of a recap of this part. They may seem crazy to other people. The things he wants us to do may seem crazy. They may not make any sense. And they may, they may be way outside your comfort zone. <laughs> I know 
I can relate to that. I, I, you know, my comfort zone is about this this big, and so pretty much everything I do is outside my comfort zone most of the time. Um, but some, but sometimes he wants us to stretch us even further outside our comfort zone, and then further outside our comfort zone. And if we're not willing, if we're not trusting him, we're not going to take those steps. And so if we don't do, if we don't allow him to stretch us and step out of our comfort zone and be obedient then we limit what he can do with us. There's a couple of things, I mean, there's a lot of things that limit what God can and will do with us, but some of those things is, is not bringing the empty vessel and not being obedient to him. Those things are necessary. Okay, and then uh, one more scripture. Could you bring up 2 Kings 4, verse 1 through 7? <clears throat> And now a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that your servant feared the Lord. And the creditor has come to take my two children to be his slaves. Elisha said to her, What shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? And she said, Your maidservant has nothing in the house except a jar of oil. Then he said, go, borrow vessels at large for yourself from all your neighbors, even empty vessels, and do not get a few. And you shall go, and you shall go in and shut the door behind you and your sons and pour out into all these vessels, and you sh shall set aside what is full. So she went from him and shut the door behind her and her sons, and they were bringing the vessels to her, and she poured when the vessels were full, she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not one vessel more. And the oil stopped. Then she came out, excuse me, then she came and told the man of God. And he said, go sell the oil and pay your debt. And you and your sons can live on the rest. I love that story. But this is a really good example of empty vessels and obedience that doesn't make sense. On human terms, it didn't make sense. But one of the things that really stood out to me here is that the oil supply was not limited. This, I believe this symbolizes the Holy Spirit pouring into our life um, and using us and pouring the gifts into our life. I believe it symbolizes lots of things, provision for us, um, it, it, just the things of God, the miraculous things that God gives us that we need, that we truly need. But the main point to make here is what was required was a kind of a blind faith, an obedience that didn't, would not have made sense to any human being. Just, you know, we've got one jar of oil in here. Well, just keep bringing me, vest or keep bringing me empty jars. Keep bringing me empty jars. And a lot of people would just laugh at that and say, yeah, you're, you're silly. I mean, the, you know, honestly, Elisha, I can picture with some of the things he did, he probably wasn't the most normal looking and acting person, I'm guessing. I don't know. And so this person shows up at your door and, and starts telling you to do these crazy things. Um, and so I can just imagine that, that, but I believe God knew this lady's heart already. She already knew her need, or excuse me, God already knew her need and her son's need, and he knew her heart, that she had faith and that she would be obedient to this command. And so she had Elisha talk to her and give her this command. But she was obedient. She, she started borrowing vessels. She started bringing vessels. And, and God poured out and poured out and poured out and poured out. And so a couple of things here. The oil didn't stop until the empty containers were no longer being brought. So that, to me, that's very symbolic. Um, we need to daily just keep coming back to God. For all our needs, we need to keep coming back to God. Don't stop. Don't stop. Because he won't stop. If we keep coming back to him, he's not going to stop. He's going to keep pouring out into us. He's going to keep providing for our needs. He's going to keep giving us more and more of the Holy Spirit. He's not going to stop. He's faithful. But we have to do our part. We have to keep coming back to him every day, every day, every day, sometimes multiple times a day. Probably a good idea. I know I need to multiple times a day. Um, the oil supply was unlimited, and I believe it still is. His supplies are unlimited. And he wants to pour out more and more of himself on us and his spirit upon us 
he will give us as much as we can handle. He'll just keep on giving it to us until we just can't handle it anymore or we keep or quit coming back to him. He will just keep, he will just keep going because he's faithful. And one, one key point here, I think, God doesn't limit us in this. Typically, we limit ourselves. And we stop running into his presence. So that's something to remember is we limit ourselves in how much God can use us. He is wanting to use us. All we have to do is be obedient and bring ourselves to him and not put um, limits, not block him, basically, with, with our own fears, with our own doubts. We need to turn to him, just keep coming back to him in humble obedience. It brings to mind um, some scriptures. I don't, I don't have it memorized what they are, and I didn't, I didn't put them on the screen, but um, God lifts up the humble. He lifts up the humble. He resists the proud, but he lifts up the humble, and he gives grace to the humble. So this, this is a good picture of what he wants us to do, I believe. Yes, hallelujah. So he, he, he just wants us to come to him humbly, obediently, and bring ourselves to him. That's what he wants is us, our hearts. He doesn't need our money. He doesn't need even our service. He doesn't need us to, to do anything for him. He doesn't need that, but he just wants our hearts. And then as, as a natural outpouring, we will usually want to do things for him. Um, and so anyway, when we stop being obedient to his leading, that will, that's when he'll stop pouring out on us. He, he won't stop being graceful. He won't stop calling us back to him, but he will, will be, we will be limiting what he can do through us. So as long as we're hungry for him, for more of him, he will provide more and more. So that, that is really the message I have here. One more time, we need to bring him ourselves as an empty vessel and desperation for him and just keep coming back to him day after day and trusting that he's going to pour into us because that's what he wants to do that's his idea he came up with that idea so that's it so i'm going to close in prayer praise you father god thank you so much god thank you so much that you are such an awesome and generous god you're so selfless lord god you are so amazing to us, Lord God. You're such a loving Father, Lord God. You know exactly what we need before we ask. You, you know exactly what our minds are thinking. You know exactly what's distracting us. You know exactly what our fears are. You know exactly where we are in life, Lord God. You know every detail, Lord God. Thank you that as you know all of that, Lord God, you are working. You are working in our lives, Lord God. If we, if we get out of your way, you will be working in our lives even more and more, Lord God. Thank you that when we, when we are weak, that's when you display your strength the most, Lord God. Lord God, thank you, God, for your kindness and your mercy, Lord God. I do pray that anything, Holy Spirit, that you want to just resonate with people and to sink into hearts and minds and change people's lives, Lord God, I pray that those, would be, those words would be effective, Lord God. Holy Spirit, use what was said here, Lord God. Anything that you don't want people to remember, just... Just delete it from their minds, Lord God. Have your way, Lord God. It's all about you, Lord God. All the honor is yours. All the glory is yours, Lord God. Thank you so much for the blood, Jesus, that you poured out for us, Lord God. Thank you so much, Lord God, for the Holy Spirit that you give us, Lord God. Thank you so much for your presence, Lord God, for your love, your mercy, God. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We can't say thank you enough, Lord praise you, God, and thank you, Lord God. I just ask you to be with the entire service today, every part of it, Lord God. Prepare hearts and minds for everything else you want to do today, Lord God. Help us to be relaxed, Lord God, but tuned into you, Lord God, and hungry for you, Lord God, obedient to you, Lord God. I pray that you would bless every part of this service, Lord God, and let everything said and done here today bring glory to you, Lord God. Use it your way, Lord God. And ask these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.